If you take your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 25. Matthew, chapter number 25. This morning we'll be looking at the first 13 verses of this particular chapter. Matthew, chapter 25, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The last words that were audibly spoken by Jesus Christ to a human being What were they? Well, we know that the Lord continues to speak to us today, but not in an audible fashion. Uh, He speaks to us through the word of God, the written word of God. But the last words that Jesus actually spoke to a man that were heard by a man is found in Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 20, where Jesus said, Surely I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. And to that, John's response was, even so come, Lord Jesus. In fact, three times in this last chapter of the book of the Revelation, in chapter 22, Jesus says, I come quickly. And I want to pay special attention to one of those verses, Revelation 22 and verse number 12, where Jesus said, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. In that statement by our Lord Jesus Christ, there are two promises that are given. First of all, there is the promise, once again, that our Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He said, behold, I come quickly. And the word that is quickly, that is translated quickly, in the Greek, taku, It doesn't mean quickly with respect to how fast he will come, but it speaks to the suddenness and the surprise that will take place when Jesus does come. And uh, there is a promise of his return, but also there is the promise in that verse of rewards for our labours as Christians. And so today, not only here this morning, but also this evening, Lord willing, I want us to keep that statement of our Lord uppermost in our mind. And the reason is because in Matthew chapter 25, our Lord gives us two parables about these promises. In verses 1 through 13 that we've just got through reading, we have a parable about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the return of Christ. Behold, I come quickly. And we see that there in verse number 6, that at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So in this parable, Jesus talks about his quick return, his sudden, unexpected return. And then this evening, Lord willing, as we look at the second parable from verse 14 to verse number 30, we have a parable about rewards, where he will come to reward every man according as his work should be. By the way, here in chapter 25, 
These were the last two parables that our Lord spoke during his earthly ministry. Uh, I've counted up about 35 different parables that are recorded for us. I'm sure he used others, but these are the ones that have found their way into the word of God. And these are the last two. The next day in the life of Jesus, after he spoke the Olivet Discourse in chapter 24 and here in chapter 25, on the next day, uh, he would meet with his church in the upper room on Tuesday evening. They would institute, or he would institute, the first Lord's Supper. And then Jesus went to the garden. In Matthew 26, the Bible says in verse number 1 and 2, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And one of the most uh, interesting parts about our Lord's life and his death on the cross was that at the very time that the Jews were killing the Passover lambs in memory of that great event that took place in Egypt, our Lord was shedding his precious blood as the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary. And so we're very close to that time. And by Wednesday, nine o'clock in the morning, Jesus was on the cross. So these words that we read were spoken on a Monday, two days out from his crucifixion. Now, I do believe that Matthew 25 is part of the Olivet Discourse, that as we've been looking through chapter 24 and we've seen how the Lord answered the questions of the disciples, when shall these things be, what shall be the sign of thy coming, and what shall be the sign of the end of the world, that he continues on in, with these parables in that discourse up on the Mount of Olives. Now, why do I say that? Well, look, let's do a little comparison here. If you have your Bibles open, look at Matthew 24 and verse number 42. Jesus said, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Compare that to chapter 25, verse 13, where Jesus says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour where the Son of Man cometh. And uh, so we see that these are... Uh, still on the same theme that Jesus was speaking up there on that mountain. Now we've mentioned before that Matthew 24 is Jewish in context and uh, yet I believe that there is a change in the latter part from verse number 42 and on. Uh, Matthew 24 verse 42 which we just read going on down to verse 44 Jesus talks about the unexpected return of Jesus Christ himself. In verse 42, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And I think that that word also there in verse 44 uh, the Lord transfers from talking about uh, what's happening with the Jews to uh, speaking to his disciples as Christians here uh, from the, uh, ver these verses to the end of the chapter. But he also goes on in Matthew 24, in verse 45, down to verse 51 of talking about rewards for faithful service. Look at verse 45, for example. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And so I believe that we can connect Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, and particularly in these two parables which are addressed uh, covering the return of Christ and the rewards. Now, Matthew 25 actually has three sections to it. And it's interesting the prophetic order in which we find these passages. Uh, it begins here in verses 1 through 13 with the rapture. And as Christians, that is the event that we are waiting for. 
that we are expecting. We don't know when our Lord is coming, but he is coming and it will be a glorious moment, a twinkling of the eye moment, when we'll be caught up to be with the Lord. So the first parable deals with the rapture. The second deals with the reckoning, which is a parable of service, and it's very well known where the servants are brought before the Lord and he wants to see what they've done with their talents. We'll preach on that this evening, Lord willing. And then from verse 31 to 46, we have the second coming of Christ in power and great glory. It says that in verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And these, Matthew 25 is in a correct prophetic order. The rapture is the next event. That will be followed by the judgment seat of Christ and following that, Jesus will come in power and great glory upon the earth. And it's interesting that each of those segments uh, talk about a separation. In the parable of the ten virgins, there's a separation between the saved and the lost. In the parable of the, of the uh, three servants and the talents, there is a separation from those who are profitable and those who are slothful. And in the latter part, the judgment, uh, the great uh, the, uh, throne of glory judgment, uh, there's a separation of the nations at the coming of Christ into the sheep and the goats. And we'll get to that in due time. But these parables here are talking about the kingdom of heaven. In verse number 1 of chapter 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened. And it's a, a parable that talks about the kingdom of God. Well, we, we know that the kingdom of God uh, is in its present form an invisible universal spiritual kingdom if you are saved you are in the kingdom of God you are born again into the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ is the king and we are his subjects that is the relationship we enjoy uh, now of course Jesus is coming again in glory to establish a literal visible earthly kingdom and that's the subject of the latter part of this chapter but I think it's fitting that as the Lord has given all of these parables through his earthly ministry, that he finishes up with these two parables, one of salvation and then a parable of service. Because it applies to each of us today. You know, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, explain where the works, the good deeds that we do come in. Listen to what the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What that simply means is that there is nothing that you or I could ever do to merit favor with God. Such is our sinful condition. But we are saved by grace. God loves us. He sent his son to die for us, taking our place, and he will save us as a free gift of grace. Praise God for that. But that scripture goes on to say, to those of us who are saved, for ye are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we are not saved by our works, but once we are saved, God has called us to serve him. And so these parables will fit together in that thought. Today we're looking here at the parable of the ten virgins, which is a parable of salvation. Now it's one of those parables that has been made to walk on all fours. When you interpret the Bible, particularly when it comes to parables, there are two key rules that you have to keep in mind. Number one, that there is one central truth that God is wanting to give. And number two, that the details of the parable convey that truth, but they themselves are not necessarily statements of truth. You say, why do you bring that out? Because a lot of people have looked at this parable and because they've interpreted every little detail, they've come up with some strange beliefs. For example, they would say, well, the virgins, uh, that must be the Lord's churches. And it's true that 
Uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians, a New Testament church is referred to as a chaste virgin in Christ. So they immediately uh, connect the two and oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and so they interpret the par parable, well, there were five virgins that missed out on the rapture. That's a scary teaching, to think that some Christians will miss out on the rapture. That's not taught in the Bible, by the way. But if you interpret the details of a parable to the nth degree, you can come up with some strange beliefs. And the fact that you can buy the Holy Spirit, because they were told to go out and buy oil. Well, you ask Simon, the sorcerer, in Acts chapter 8 about buying the Holy Spirit. He thought the gift of the Holy Spirit could be bought with money. <laughs> and Peter said, thy money perish with you, thinking that the gift of God is something that can be purchased. So when we interpret parables, and in particular a parable such as this, we've got to look at what is the main point that the Lord is trying to get across and not to interpret all the details as if that's part of the doctrine that is being brought forth. Now what is important when we understand this parable is to understand the marriage customs of the Bible times. Uh, most of us have witnessed weddings in this country and we know that uh, weddings take a certain form, maybe a few variations, but basically they, the groom comes out and stands here and then the bride comes through the door on the arm of her father, and uh, the preacher says, "Who will uh, wilt thou take this woman?" And he wilts, and uh, and uh, <laughs> you know how it is. And uh, there's a, a, a brief ceremony, and they say their vows, and the preacher says, "I now pronounce you to be husband and wife." They go out those doors with a big smile. Everybody's happy. We have a maybe a reception, and uh, they're off on their honeymoon. Uh, a little bit different in the Bible days, and. In order to understand what is being taught or said here in Matthew 25, we need to understand that there was a slightly different process. Let me outline this very quickly for you. After the betrothal, uh, they didn't have engagements in those days, they had a betrothal that was sealed by the paying of the bride price. And that was uh, equivalent to a covenant. But the bride and the bridegroom would sometimes separate for up to one year so that they could prepare for their married life together. Uh, for the man, he would prepare his house. In his father's home, he would prepare a place. Uh, she would prepare her trousseau and uh, wait for that day of the wedding. And the wedding took place usually at night time. Uh, and the bridegroom would then come to the house where the bride was in a torchlight procession, accompanied by the best man and his groomsmen. And the bride would be expecting that to happen, but she just wouldn't know exactly when. And then she would hear the shout, letting her know that the bridegroom is here. And so she and her companions would go out to meet the groom. And usually the bride's companions were virgins. They were bride's maids, unmarried. Psalm 45 verses 13 through 13 talks about the, uh, the uh, king, the companions of the queen as virgins, her companions that follow her, the king's daughter, I should say. And so they would come and there would be a great procession through town with lamps burning and they would return to the home of the bridegroom. And he would take the bride into the bride chamber and the wedding would be consummated. And then there would be seven days of feasting rejoicing and a great supper. I wonder if the dads had to pay for that. <laughs> but that's how they did it. And understanding the oriental custom, uh, which is in many ways still practiced in some form today, it helps us to understand what Jesus was relaying here in this particular parable. And there's a tremendous analogy between the wedding customs and uh, and and uh, the relationship that Jesus Christ has with his churches. The Bible calls Christ the bridegroom. John the Baptist, by the way, is the friend of the bridegroom. John 3.29, he's the best man. Uh, the New Testament churches are called pure, chaste virgins. The bride price was paid. It was the blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, through the New Covenant. 
right now, the bridegroom is preparing a place for us in the Father's house. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And so he will come for his bride. We just don't know when. And after that, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. The wife and the guests are all there, Revelation 19, followed by a 1,000-year honeymoon. Can you imagine that? And finally, he will take his bride to the eternal home, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And so when the Bible talks about marriage in that fashion, we can understand that it is really a great picture. Now, when it comes to this parable, the ten virgins are the companions of the bride. But the significance of the parable comes in three statements, and these are the three points I want to bring out very briefly here. In verse number 10, the Bible says, While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him. So the first thought is, they that were ready. In the same verse, the Bible says, And the door was shut. And then in verse number 12, he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. So these are the three points I want you to think about this morning because this is the point of the parable. It's, it's to be interpreted as being ready for the rapture. Being ready for the rapture. And the point is that when Jesus comes, there's going to be a separation that will take place between the saved and the lost. The first thing is the thought, they that were ready. Verse number 10, once again. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. Now, as I said, these virgins were the companions of the bride. And there were those who were ready, and there were those who were unprepared. They all knew that the bridegroom was coming at some time. They knew it would be soon. But they, they knew it would be in such an hour as you think not. But only five were ready and five were not ready. You know, the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ is no secret. You've heard it many times from the pulpit here and I'm sure you've read about it in the Bible. It's mentioned many times. We know Jesus Christ is coming. <clears throat> it's taught in, uh, by every New Testament writer, the coming of Christ. And uh, so we know that he's coming whether you believe it or not, he is coming. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? You say, well, how do I get ready? How do I get ready for when Jesus comes? Well, simply salvation. You need to be saved. You know, the Bible says in, uh, in the great rapture passage, and we'll not turn there today because we've read it several times over the last several weeks, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, which describes the rapture being caught up together with the dead in Christ will meet the Lord in the air. Here's the, here's the condition. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we shall be caught up together. You see, the only way you can be ready for the coming of Christ is to be born again, to be a, a child of God. To be ready is to be saved. And so... You need to ask yourself the question, and I would implore you to ask yourself honestly today, if Jesus were to come in this next moment, would I be left behind or would I be caught up to be with him? Don't put your trust in religion. Don't put your trust in all the good things that you may do in life, and I'm sure there are many. Don't have a, well, I hope so, kind of a belief, because the Bible has given, us, given to us that we can have a no-so. We know, I know whom I have believed. In the book of 1 John, which is the book of assurance, the word know is found, I know. And, and, and we can know that we are saved based not on how we feel or what we think, but on what God says. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Ask yourself the question, do I know for sure that I'm saved today. Is my hope resting on the finished work of Jesus Christ? There were those that were ready and they went out to meet the bridegroom. And there were those who were left behind. 
The second point in verse number 10 is simply that the door was shut. What a solemn truth this is, that when Jesus comes, the door of salvation is going to be shut after that. We've talked about that uh, in looking at the Olivet Discourse. Uh, People would say, well, if the rapture came, if my wife was taken, uh, if my children were taken, or if my husband was suddenly gone, and I knew the rapture had taken place and I'd missed out, I'd get saved in a heartbeat. But we know the Bible says to the opposite, the contrary. In 2 Thessalonians, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those that have heard the gospel and haven't trusted Christ, there won't be another opportunity. There'll be some lie given as to why all these people have suddenly disappeared from the face of the earth. I don't know what they'll say. Might blame it on COVID, who knows? But the fact is, people will believe whatever they're told. People are being conditioned today to believe what they're told about a number of important things that aren't necessarily true. The door was shut. Reminds me of the day that God brought Noah into the ark. You know, the door was left open for 10 more days. God's long suffering was maybe others would believe what Noah was preaching. He, for 120 years, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. No doubt standing up there on the deck of the ark as the crowds came to mock and saying, there's coming a day of judgment. God's going to send a flood. Ah, they laughed at him. Until the day that God shut the door and then the rains came and the subterranean waters broke up and the earth began to be deluged and there was a universal flood. And I'm sure then they came and said, Lord, open to us as these virgins did. Lord, open to us and Noah, give us, get, get us on the ark. But it was too late. Too late, the door was shut. We've said this before, and I'll say it again because it's so important. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. God is opening the door of salvation for you. If you're not a Christian, you can be saved today. Put your faith and trust in Christ today and have the assurance that when Jesus comes, you'll be with him. Yes, they that were ready went to be with the Lord Those that weren't ready found the door was shut. Then the last point I want to say in verse number 12 are these sad words, solemn words, but he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. You know, that's the essence of true salvation. Salvation is not just having a head knowledge about Jesus Christ. You can grow up in Sunday school and know all about Jesus, but it's having a personal relationship with Christ. Look back a few pages to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, this is part of that other great discourse of Christ on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 21 through 23, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, that is preached in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Oh, what terrible words. You see, salvation is having a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith. It's knowing him. In fact, in John's Gospel, chapter 10, in verse number 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The question really is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? 
You say, well, what is meant by a personal relationship? Well, let me give you three thoughts about that, three C's. And by the way, this works for marriage also. You know, a husband and wife are supposed to have a personal relationship. That's what makes a marriage. And, uh, and it's a growing thing, of course. When my wife and I were first married, we had a lot to learn about each other. Uh, you know, that I don't always put down the lid and uh, put the cap on the toothpaste and things like that. I do today, by the way. We, <laughs> we have a good relationship. But what is, what is a relationship, either in marriage with your wife or husband or with Jesus Christ? Same thing. C, communication. You listen to each other. You speak to each other. You seek out each other's needs. And in, as a Christian, of course, we listen to God's word. We talk to the Lord. We seek the mind of Christ. What does the Bible say? That's a relationship. Could you imagine a husband having a relationship with a wife where he never talks to her, won't listen to her, has no concern about what her needs might be. That's not a relationship. There must be communication. Secondly, commitment. Living for one another. That's the essence of love, a, un, an unconditional commitment to the wife. And when we have a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, it's a commitment to him, to live for him. That Christ lives as, and he lives for us. So we have communication, we have a commitment, and we have a cherishing. We love him because he first loved us. We cherish. You know, the Bible commands a husband to cherish his wife. And as Christians, we cherish our saviour. That's a relationship. As I said, it's not a head knowledge, but it's communication and a commitment and a cherishing with the one who died for us. And yes, as you grow as a Christian, that relationship grows deeper every day. And you know, there are things today after over 40 years of marriage that I know what my wife is thinking. She knows what I'm thinking. Uh, we have each other's minds. And as you grow as a Christian and you get into the word of God and you have that relationship, you begin to have the mind of Christ, you know what God's word says and you act accordingly. But Jesus said to those who weren't saved, I know you not. There was no relationship. We need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that comes when we are first born again into the kingdom of God, when we are saved, when we trust Christ as our saviour. That begins the relationship that takes us through the rest of our life and for all of eternity. So do you have a relationship? Are you ready for the rapture? Or if Jesus came right now, would you be left behind? You know, Christ concludes this parable with an admonition. Look at verse 13. He said, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Nobody, if anybody tells you that Jesus Christ is coming on this day and gives you the date and the year, you know they're telling not the truth. No man knows the day nor the hour. We just have to be ready. And if I can hammer this one truth home this morning, it is simply that Jesus is coming back. He's coming again. Let's look at the scriptures here real quick. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's what we're doing right now. We're preaching the gospel along with other New Testament churches. We're doing our best to preach the gospel to every creature. But there's going to come a time when the end will come. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 20. 4 verse 42, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. 
How many times do we get up in the morning and we plan our day and we never give a thought to the fact that Jesus could come? That's when he might come, when you think not. And then Matthew 25 and verse 6, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Midnight, that's a time when most people are in bed. That's a time when we're not thinking about the coming of Christ. But he, he will come. Whether it's, we got through singing, whether it's in the, in the morning, in the daytime, um, whether it's in the evening, Jesus is coming again. He will come. And whether you're saved, you need to be ready for that event. Whether you're lost and you need to be saved, now is the day of salvation. I trust that you will take this message seriously today because I can think of no more pressing matter than to know beyond a shadow of a doubt based on God's holy word that you are saved, that you know the Lord.